and we are your election command center. 18 days to that general election, the 7th of December 2024. And when it comes to all the comprehensive coverage up to the minute, please make sure you trust us and we'll bring you that detailed coverage. You remember, as always, we've been in the communities with Community Manifesto and now the Women's Manifesto in the run up to this election. We're discussing all the issues, getting the latest soundbite and then speaking to the key stakeholders, not only politically, but also those in industry, civil society, and the various spheres of our society. That's it. It also means that we have to remind you that we have cash out. It goes with the short code star 439 hash. And so what you need to do is to make sure that you build up to that mega jackpot that will be held when we are talking about the draws on Friday. Over the last six weeks, this is what we've been doing, giving in excess 50,000 Ghana cities to many of you, especially those Fridays. And so we build up to that Friday mega jackpot by also making sure that with star 439 hash for today, you choose option two, which is TV3, because you're watching TV3 New Day. And as always, please make sure that you increase in multiple times the number of tickets per what the prompt will give you. And so when you do that, when we do the draws, you're going to win in excess over 1,000, 2,000 Ghana cities for each of the draws during the weekdays. And then also on Friday, you win that big mega jackpot as it is. Well, for those who have joined us this morning, we're grateful. And so please make sure you share the stream. Now, 18 days to that major election, we want to really examine the energy industry and then also the industry that's looking at how we're able to transition when it comes to the sort of generation that we need. We need a mix or the world is going green or we're depleting our forests. We're having vegetative cover destroyed or we're doing some replenishing by way of the policy implementation, planting trees, etc. In the midst of this, we have to ask civil society as well as those within the sector, what do you think about the options that are being offered by the various key stakeholders in the game of politics, what they are selling to us. The political parties will delve into their manifestos and they have some great conversation. Regulars um, will be with us in the studio. Joining us uh, on Zoom very soon will be Nana Mwesi, the seventh executive director for the Institute for Energy Security. But right here in the studio, a very experienced man when it comes to the extractive industry and then also does a lot of advocacy. Uh, leads uh, policy advocacy, its implementation, etc. On the civil society side, Dr. Steve Mantia is in the studio. He's the chairperson for the CSO's Alliance for Political Manifestos. Good morning to you, Dr. Mantia. Good morning. It's not easy to have you in the studio. Wow, well, I'm here. Yes, yeah, yeah. certainly. So we're grateful. Dr. Charles Jane Fiofori is a policy lead for uh, the Africa Center for Energy Policy. He is in charge as policy lead for climate change and energy transition. Good morning to you, Dr. Ofori. Good morning. Great. Yeah. Nice to have you once again. Uh, uh, Dr. Mantia, let me just uh, go, go straight to you. If you do a cursory analysis of what the manifesto propositions are from the political parties, what is there for us when it comes to the energy sector? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think both the two major parties do recognize um, the near crisis situation in which we find ourselves as a country. And they've all made pledges to kind of um, deal with the situation. But what strikes me is the uh, proposition that I consider overly ambitious which are from the... NPP, which is to add some 2,000 megawatts of renewable energy mm. to our energy mix. Um, reason I find it overly ambitious is the fact that currently our peak demand is around between 3,300 and 3,800 there about. And so to promise to scale up renewable component of the mix, energy mix uh, by 2,000 megawatts suggests to me that we are going to be generating much more from renewables than we do currently from uh, fossil fuels. You mean to make that projection, that's what it means? Yes, yeah, that's Practically, what Practically, how would did it look like to generate 2,000 megawatts? I find it overly ambitious because 
one, currently we're doing about 1% renewables generation mm. to, in, in our energy mix. So, and the NPP had promised earlier to actually increase this to 10%. As we speak, we are no more nowhere near the 10%. We are around 1.52%. So for you to project that you're going to move from 1% and by adding more than 60% of renewable energy to the current energy mix sounds a near, near impossibility. And for me, that is the concern. But it also kind of creates a kind of a, a dissonance for me is the fact that I am aware of an investor, a foreign investor, who has already invested 30 million US dollars in feasibility studies towards the production of renewable energy in Ghana. No. It's done wind, okay. solar, okay. and all that. And the complaint from this investor who reached out to me after I'd made some Com uh, comments, comments on the energy sector was that he's been frustrated by people in the current government um, in terms of obtaining the necessary regulatory permits to be able to proceed with his investments. Does it mean that the policy structures are not accommodating, or we just have bureaucracies and bottlenecks as no, a result of it? It is not just the policy structures. I think it is a general perception across the industry that rent seeking is on the high. Um, the entire investment environment in Ghana is seen as very hostile. Um, this investor I'm talking about complaints of people trying to extort money from him, people seeking um, shares in his business in return for certain approval. You mean in the corridors of power? Yes, currently, yeah. And so he's not going anywhere with his proposal. And, and, and for me, for a government in power, to, I'm not too sure if the uh, current presidential candidate for the MPP is aware, but I'll be surprised if he's not. And I want to believe that uh, his promise of adding 2,000 megawatts per hour may be as a result of being aware of this investor who is in the wings. But for me, I hope it does not create a situation of rent seeking and deterring other investors when we are making such ambitious uh, pledges. Propositions. Yeah. Well, Dr. Foria, at the heart of this conversation is also that we're being enticed with this policy propositions because that's where the world is mo is gravitating towards is, is that not true and currently the we have the the cop 29 uh, taking place in azerbaijan currently and so the conversation is about that if we have to do that mix or the transition what so far have we done that gives you the hope that maybe perhaps if we put uh, that as a, as an ambition, as an objective, as a goal, we're likely to meet it not just as political parties, but also as a country as a as a whole. Right. Thank you very much. I think um, first of all, it's it's very important to highlight the fact that when you are introducing such promises, it needs to align with with a plan, um, a plan to ensure that the the supply that we are creating or that we intend to create, there's a demand for, for that, so that you don't get to a point where you have an imbalance between what you are demanding for and then what you are supplying. Um, creating the promise of adding additional capacity of renewables to our mix, it's not, it's not a problem, but again, it has to deal with the, with the process within which you acquire uh, some of these mixes, and then the feasibility around it, just as um, Senior has, has mentioned. Ghana has what we call an integrated power system master plan, which provides a, a, a well thought through plan on how we can add on to our, our power supply mix between now and then 2040. It considers a myriad of scenarios and then a lot of options for, for power generation, including um, using our own thermal and our own gas resources, adding renewables, even going nuclear and adding a lot of capacities to, to it. Now, one of the things that the, the power plant, the, the, the plan actually mentioned was that the, it is important that 
in order to drive down the cost of, of power generation, these things need to be competitively procured. Competitively procured. So it's not just about adding capacity. It's about the nature of procurement. It's about the plans around the agreement, the contracting. How are the, what, what, what are the transparency mechanisms around the contracting process? What, are the, 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 what, what is the nature of agreement that we are going into? What is the impact of such capacity additions on our tariffs? And those are the things that our manifestos are not are failing to, to capture. And when you don't capture those things and then you go around saying that we are adding this amount of capacity to our energy mix, it is fine. But then when the impact on our tariffs is, is happening because we've not really sat down to look at the transparency mechanisms and we've not sat down to look at competitive procurement, we've not sat down to actually create demand mm. for the new supplies that we are looking at and also examining the feasibility of it, then it becomes something that we need to question. Mm. So uh, we'll be joined by Nana Mwesi very soon, the executive director for the Institute for Energy Security. So we'll be having some latest update from him. Um, good morning to you, Nana Mwesi. Have you joined us yet? But if not, then if you take a look, Dr. Steve Mantia, at the propositions from the parties, um, what should be our immediate, perhaps, um, objective then? <laughs> Um, strengthening the current regulatory and then also the energy mix that we have or trying to be overly ambitious? I think the first and foremost consideration would be the policy and the regulatory regime. Um, currently, we've not tweaked it in the way that actually makes it attractive for even individuals to procure um, solar uh, power. Um, because of the absence of a, a net metering uh, pr um, um, a framework. Um, I know with the World Bank support, we've been doing some pilot work on, on, on net metering. At ISODEC, for instance, for the past 20, 24 years, we've been generating about 40% uh, of our own uh, power when I used to be there. Um, and, and, and you find on weekends, for instance, when you visit the facility, you find that when the batteries are full, all the excess power that is generated by our solar panels feed into the national grid. But the institution does not get anything in return mm. on days when it is not able to generate enough for internal use. To do this, you need a net metering such that you build up credit mm. when you supply to the grid. And then on days when you're not able to generate enough, you can buy back your, with your credit the power that you, you need to operate. Uh, we do not have this in place currently, and that creates a problem. Again, we need to also sort out the tariff. We cannot have a uniform tariff for fossil fuel generated power and solar uh, generated power. So we need to have this. There's been some pushback from ECG on account that, look, if we're all going to be power generators, then of course, we are going to push the institution out of business. These are issues that need to be brought to the fore and we need to discuss to find solutions too. But I, I think that it, it is in the long term in the interest of a country like Ghana mm. to be f prioritizing solar and, and wind energy mm. to mitigate the challenges that we currently face. I say this because within the EU itself, there's an awful lot of opportunity under the EU taxonomy program, where the EU is encouraging much more investments in fossil fuel, no, in, in, in renewables rather than in fossil fuel. And so for a company that is seeking uh, investments from the EU, that will be a huge challenge because such uh, investments are outlawed within the EU. But if you are looking for investments within the EU for uh, solar or renewable energy in general, then of course that, that comes at ease. But the question is, how have we as a country, what kinds of incentive regime have we put in place to be able to generate uh, investments into the renewable energy sector? I'm also aware of um, another investor who is intending to go into nuclear, but also having its own challenges and all that. So I think we need to make the investment environment, mm -hmm. yes, the framework, the policy regulatory framework that goes also with certain incentive regime to be able to attract the right quantum of investments to be able to make that objective, that overly ambitious objective, achievable.
Mm. Uh, just not long ago, the conversation was about how Galam say its lack of regulation and supervision had led to massive destruction and degradation of not only the environment and then also our water and river bodies. How does that fit into the current structure as we have in terms of the narrative, Dr. Fori? In terms of the, the, the narrative, uh, as far as Galamse is, is concerned, I think um, we've, been, we've been seeing quite a number of promises on how government intends to, or future governments intend to solve the, the, the issues around Galamse. You know, as far as our laws and our environmental laws on mining and regulations on mining are concerned, I think Ghana has one of the, 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 the foremost, you know, one of the best and most comprehensive laws around land reclamation, around environmental permits, environmental impact um, assessments, and all of those things that would have been necessary to deal with the with the with the Kanka and the issue of of, of Galamse. And when, when when you think about it, it's not because of the merely absence of of, of regulations to deal with it, but it's really about the will and then the ability for our um, actors, uh, political actors and state actors to really, you know, deal with the canker. And it's, and it's um, also because of the, 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 the kind of gains that, that everybody who is in there is, is, is gaining from it. So once you are not very, very much conscious enough to actually put the bull by the horn and say that, yes, we are dealing with it and we are ensuring that the laws that we have do work for, for us, we will continue to go around um, in introducing um, one initiative upon the other, trying to deal with the canker. But, but really, the, the point for us is to look at the application of, of the law, the application of the, of the Environmental um, Protection Act and, and all of those things that we have to safeguard the environment and, and, to deal with the, and to deal with the issue, basically. Dr. Mantiel, you have been working in the space for a very long time, I mean, for God knows how. Um, why have we failed at this, Galam say? Well, um, between 2008 and 2019, um, I think the World Bank supported Ghana to implement the Natural Resource and Environmental Governance Program, the NREG, and sank hundreds of millions of dollars into the program to help this country deal with the um, illegalities in the mining and forestry sectors. Um, at the end of the program, um, according to the end of program um, evaluation report, illegalities in the mining sector and also in the um, forestry sector more than doubled. And the end, the end of project evaluation report puts this to um, vested interest, uh, meaning all the institutions and actors who have the power to stem illegal mining in this country were themselves either directly involved in the illegal mining or were beneficiaries of the illegal mining activities. And so if you ask me why we've not been able to make any progress, a, a whole World Bank project implemented in this country has actually revealed why we were not able to make progress, and that is vested interest. So in all our search for solutions, I think we need to be able to look at how we deal with the issue of vested interest. I strongly believe that if a minister of a government in power is cited for complicity in illegal mining, mm. brought before the courts mm. and put behind bars, that will send a very strong signal to those who are complicit in the activity. I always cite Otunfo as a very good example. He worked with the national security, I mean the um, the National, National Security Apparatus? Yeah, that's right. Uh, formerly NI, uh, NI, uh, that's NI. That's uh, National Investigative Bureau. Bureau. And they were formerly BNI. To, yeah, exactly. And they were able to adduce evidence of the complicity of some three chiefs in, in, in illegal mining. And Otunfo, on the basis of the findings of that report, distilled the three chiefs. But I would have expected our security agencies, those with prosecutorial powers, to have moved in and have arrested these chiefs and put them before court. At least 
Utum for the debate by the stolen them. But we have state security agencies who have the power to prosecute. And so beyond the, the stolen, you, you would expect that these people are brought before court and sanctioned. Now that there's been no, no consequences beyond the stolen, they only go back and, and intensify the activities, in illegal mining activities. So I, I believe that until we find a way to deal with vested interests, I mean, the involvement of highly placed people in the illegal mining activities, mm. we are not going to go far. The people who are arrested in the pit are not the people who are actually sponsoring or perpetuating the illegalities in the mining sector. It is the people we don't see who actually hide behind the corridors of power to perpetuate these activities. Okay. Nana Amwesi is Executive Director for the Institute for Energy Security. He is joining us. Good morning to you. Nana Amwesi, the seventh. Please unmute for me. Good morning to you, uh, Roland, yeah. to my three panelists and your viewers. Okay, great. And just to bring you in, why have we failed to prosecute people, especially when you do a critical analysis of the Professor from Pombwating uh, report on illegal mining, and subsequently the revelations in there, the actions that needed to be taken by uh, this government especially, on its own officials and assigns, when it comes to illegal mining, or Galamse? Well, Roland, we, we are failed because um, a, a few hear statements like, party no here, Sika, and uh, my, nobody's complicit in uh, illegal mining in my government, then it clearly tells you that um, this is this is not something that the government will want to take an action on because government itself is complicit in this act. And so this is why we, we've not seen any strong action on Gallam say that is devastating our land, our water body, and threatening our very existence as a people. I see. So to what end then is there the commitment for the future? In order to make sure that the concerns about politically exposed persons and then their connected people do not remain and perpetrate illegality? Well, I, I think um, to this point, I must congratulate uh, citizens. Um, They've been very uh, strong on government, just that you've had an adamant uh, government. Uh, we were promised that, uh, in fact, uh, their political you know, existence, they can even place online for Galamse, meaning they will do everything within their body, water and blood, to stop Galamse. But uh, day in, day out, we see the devastation uh, grow. Um, and so we ask ourselves, to what end? You, they do deploy people uh, once in a while, um, all trying to portray to Ghanaians that an action is being taken. But really, we all know the, the end. Uh, at the end of the day, we still are struggling to have, um, you know, clean water uh, to be processed to some certain end for safe consumption. Mm -hmm. We all know that the local sector is struggling because uh, people are exchanging those lands for galamse purposes. And so what do we do? Um, we've called on government uh, to, for example, uh, the law that was passed to allow mining in forest reserve to be reversed. Unfortunately, um, time hasn't been on our side. Parliament is not certain. But we even ask ourselves, would it have been done if Parliament was certain? And so we leave it for citizens to decide uh, which government they want to choose uh, to protect their environment and their very existence. Well, Dr. Mantea, that then leads me uh, to you. Which of the manifestos have you done a critical analysis on? And I'll come to all of you, the same question. That you think that the propositions are good for the future, the immediate future, and then the long term as well. And where do you think they can be better implemented, or how? Well, um, <clears throat> I have actually analyzed the manifestos of the ruling government, um, MPP, um, that of the 
largest opposition party, NDC, uh, Movement for Change. Um, I think these are the three... The Great Transformation Plan, the GTP. Yes, yes. The reason I have not looked at the others is because at the time the analysis was being done, um, the others did not have a manifesto. So those manifestos that were available and publicly accessible at the time were analyzed by my good self. Um, I'm happy with what I find in the manifestos across the political divide. Both MPP and NDC have some good measure of policies to deal with the Galamse issue. Um, what for me will, will matter most is the faith they keep with the promises they've made if any of them should win political power. Um, again, in the analysis, I found that um, the MPP, even though well intended, um, need to refine certain aspects of their uh, manifesto. Uh, uh, pledges on the small-scale mining sector. For instance, the pledge to establish a mining development bank, or is a minerals development bank, doesn't quite sit quite well with me. Uh, reason being that one, you don't collapse about 13 or so banks in order to create another bank to pursue a certain agenda. Uh, two, there are existing vehicles that I believe can be used to achieve the objective of financial intermediation in the small-scale mining sector for Ghanaians. And, and for instance, the National Development Bank uh, uh, that we establish. Again, we have a National Investment Bank. If there are problems with the National Investment Bank, then we need to address those challenges mm -hmm. and use it as a vehicle. And exactly, and use it as a vehicle mm -hmm. for achieving that financial intermediation rather than creating an entirely new bank, especially also when you are under an IMF program. Thirdly, I also think that we have an opportunity in the Mineral Income Investment Fund. And indeed, you, 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 you can underline um, investment in the name of that institution. It's a Mineral Income Investment Fund, which allows us to invest and optimize value on our returns from mining. And so I believe that we can allow MEF to partner with existing private sector institutions to do that kind of inter financial intermediation. My fear is that if the state gets involved, sets up a bank for achieving that financial intermediation objective, chances are that they could be politicized and you find that support will be going to only party people. Mm. These are brought to the attention of the MPP and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they will address that. And then the NDC also pledged to establish what they call the gold board. Um, I've had the opportunity of bringing it to their attention that it may not be entirely a good idea and run the risk of, 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 uh, of duplicating existing functions of existing institutions um, such that they could come into real conflict with the Minerals Commission. So we need some clarity in terms of what exactly the gold board will be doing. When I queried, uh, the feedback I got suggests that they will be playing a role similar to the cocoa board type of function, where they aggregate all the gold purchases and then you have one entity exporting. That is good in the sense that it allows us to have an overview of how much gold we are exporting as a country, as against allowing individuals to export and all that. So there are good policies in, 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 on, on both sides. And I think that with our input, helping them to fine tune some of the uh, positions, um, it will help to improve the interventions. But as I indicated earlier, it matters most mm. as to whether they will keep faith mm. with the pledges they are making. I Very recall important. in 2016, mm -hmm. the MPP, for instance, in its manifesto, promised to give us something similar to the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, where the management of mineral revenues will be open, transparent, and overseen by a body like the Public Interest and Accountability Committee. But when they won the elections, they changed their mind without recourse to the people and brought us Mineral Income Investment Fund. I wouldn't say the Mineral Income Investment Fund is a bad idea, but it has deficiencies 
that for me ought to be addressed. For instance, it does not address the volatility nature of extractive uh, industry, uh, industry uh, what they call it, industry revenues. And again, it does not address the issue of intergenerational interest in the resource and all that. There are a lot of deficiencies that we brought to the attention of the Mineral Income Investment Fund itself. And I think we have some assurances that going forward, those will be addressed. Of course, subsequently, you know, we had uh, some crisis like the Japara Artists deal going botch, etc. But for you, uh, Dr. Ofori as well, what have been your own assessment, especially with the decks that you lead? As that team lead, it also means that when it comes to the transitional issues for climate change, and then also how we care for the environment to be able to create that level of energy mix and the power that we need for the medium to long term future in the manifestos. Yeah. One thing that we've always been campaigning for and highlighting and advocating is really the fact that when we begin to talk about climate action, we should realize that it has become a multi sectoral issue. And that means that it has become closely linked to our livelihoods. And so reducing climate action to only um, emissions reduction, CO2 emissions reduction, or greenhouse gas emissions reduction, will solve only a minute aspect of the problem, mm -hmm. but doesn't look at how all of these things can dovetail into, into our livelihoods. So we've been talking about ensuring that we look at both the social and then the economic aspects around, around climate action. Mm -hmm. When you study the, the various manifestos, we see um, a lot of, you can see that if you compare what was done in 2020 and 2016 to 2024, there is a lot of improvement in as far as um, promises around climate action is concerned. Taking the MPP, for instance, there are issues around renewable energy integration, issues around biofuel, um, creating the mix and then trying to look at how we can create ethanol-based industries to do these um, biofuels. They've talked about climate financing and how they can look at innovative ways of, 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 of generating um, climate financing. Even gone ahead to talk about electric vehicle um, implementation and all of that. NDC has also focused on key issues around climate you know, financing, um, renewable energy integration, and getting the kind of, of, of mix that we we, we, we we want as far as our power sector is, is concerned. Yes, some of these things are, are, are important for us, especially when there is the will for us to do so. Mm. You know, it is one thing seeing these problems, and we've seen the promises over and over and over again. Um, since 2010 uh, up to now, I can count about 15 different policies that have centered around climate action. You mean fantastic policies in the book? policies, um, promises, targets, and what stuff, and, and, and so on and so forth. Within, within 2010 and then 2022, now we are not even sure which of the policies we are actually dealing with, whether we are dealing with our energy transition framework, whether we are dealing with energy transition investment policy, are we going to do another renewable energy master plan? If there is a new change in government, what are we going to, are they going to bring in a new framework for energy transition? That is not the, the case. How do we ensure that we integrate finance, industry, energy, um, gender, and all those other um, bodies and, and sectors within the concept of climate change and then climate action? How do we integrate both skilled and unskilled labor into the issues around developing homegrown technologies necessary for energy transition? How do we minimize the fact that if all our um, renewable energy technologies are just being imported, how do you increase value? How do you train people? So these are very, very important things that should be part of the promises. And then also, lastly, on, on, on financing, our reliance has been on donor support. Donor support, World Bank, um, GCF, GEF. But a huge chunk of the of the of the financing could come from creating a, an, an investment that um, would encourage private sector sector investments. And the last check on the statistics show that Ghana has benefited only two percent out of out of that climate financing scheme from the private sector. And that means that we need to do more. And if we do not create that environment, Doc mentioned um, issues about how you can create environment, how you can reduce the extent of frustration that we give to some of these um, private sector players, we will not be able to be the kind of targets that we want to meet. Well, certainly. So we still have Cash Out goes with the shock, who's star 439 hash. Let's have uh, some fantastic uh, period where you also uh, get money credited into your mobile money account. And um, also just choose option two. And when you do cash out, it also means that you have to increase the number of tickets when you get the prompt as you dial star four 
uh, 39Hash. Uh, I already have uh, some comments coming from Nani Al-Sapon. He's a regular. He's also a, uh, a political advisor on aid to uh, Alan Chermanting. Had been uh, booming the whole of yesterday in reaction to the former president, John de Kufo's endorsement of uh, Baumia. We'll see how that goes. But Nani Al-Sapon says, Roland, let me... Uh, avert your mind to the movement for change and the alliance for revolutionary change, which I have the honor and privilege to lead. On the, and he says there's a complete ban being advocated for a period of one year for Galamse, demobilization of all machinery equipment, all earth moving equipment, inventorization being the third storage and preservation of all demobilized machinery, uh, a complete restoration of all river bodies. And then also copies uh, for me complete restoration and regeneration of de uh, degraded lands, cancellation of all small scale and community mining lands as an issue within the last 15 years. Very interesting. And then deployment of all young people previously engaged in Galamse to actively participate in plantation development exercise, among many others. Nana Moisi, let's talk on mainstream energy. And you and I have been having this conversation. What's the current story? Have we, since, since 2016, how many megawatts of power have we added to our, 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 our energy mix, so to speak, when it comes to the generation side? Well, uh, Roland, uh, generation has grown by more than 1,000 megawatts from our uh, ongoing uh, programs uh, before the entry of the new government. Uh, solar, uh, we've seen uh, new generation uh, being handled by Bui Power Authority, close to 100 megawatts. But uh, for thermal generation, we've grown that one as well, and a bit of hydro. Mm. That's so I would say roughly over the last uh, um, eight years, um, a little in excess of 1,000 megawatts have been added to our installed capacity to move us close to 5,000 uh, 400 megawatts, and that is uh, very good. If you look at our peak demand uh, of roughly 3,700 megawatts, and I'm talking about the system peak demand, mm. that includes our own consumption domestically and that's for the export market. And so um, presently, all things being equal, we have a, a very respectable uh, install capacity, but you and I know the inefficiencies in the system. Okay. Um, how do we make sure all the issues that plagued us uh, 1998, if I remember very well, 2006 to 8, I remember very, very well, 2013, starting from 2012 to about um, the beginning of uh, mid-year 2016 before we're able to resolve, uh, how do we make sure we don't get there? Because if you look at the focus from you, the industry watches, we have to put in place the measures. What measures have we put in place, whether it's generation, financing, the intermediation that is needed, and then also the projections going forward? Well, um, we, we must ensure that we strictly adhere to our master plan. It's not like, like we don't have any plan for the power sector. Year in, year out, the Energy Commission will churn out uh, our power supply uh, plan, plan and make some proposal towards ensuring that there's that adequate supply of power, robust infrastructure to move the power to consumers. Unfortunately, we don't see, seem to, uh, you know, go by the plan. I was telling somebody last week that uh, the, the doom saw we saw under Jerry John Rollins was expected and uh, we could forgive him. Because at that time, we, had, uh, we were just more reliant on hydro dimension, uh, you know, Akosombo and Pong, mm. yet that's on increasing access uh, for Ghanaians. So we knew at a point there won't be enough of power to supply to all of us. So that was hinged on the inadequate installed capacity. That under President Kofo was also expected because we we're still growing access yet more reliant on uh, hydro, no other means. And the fuel that we're relying on when we use the hydro mm. is just mm. about water. Mm. You can't predict yeah. when the rain will come down or will come down. That under President Mahama and Mel's 
was also expected because even though we've started uh, producing our own oil and gas uh, domestically, we were not getting enough. We were still reliant on fuel imports uh, from outside. At that time, we added a bit of thermal. So we moved away from uh, water as fuel. Uh, we've added also the fossil-based uh, fuel supply as well. We knew there were financial challenges. But fast forward, uh, if you look at 2017, we had, when you look at all the various, uh, you know, uh, key points, starting from install capacity or capacity, transmission, distribution, financing, fuel supply, um, I think that we had a lot of resources at our disposal, more than 4,300 uh, megawatts as of 2017. Peak demand was close to roughly 3,200 then. So it means that in terms of installed capacity, we were okay. We shouldn't have had any problem. We had money that was coming in through the Millennium Challenge account and uh, routed it through the PDS, ECG, you know, approach to get that money to fix, uh, you know, a last section of our distribution arm mm. and the transmission. Mm. And we botched the very deal that was going to give us the money because of greed and, uh, and all that. We also had Esla that was generating more than 600 uh, you know, million a year. It means that the legacy debt was going to go off the decks uh, in five years if you have applied the Esla in, uh, uh, you know, from the very intention for which we set it up. So we shouldn't have had problem at all. So if you look, and we also had domestic supply of gas, we had moved from our reliance on import of gas from Nigeria to some our own domestic supply as well. Nigeria was giving us a bait. Water level has been good in the in the Kosombo and Bui Reservoir. So for what we're seeing today, we shouldn't have experienced it at all, given the resources, given the the the, uh, the opportunity granted us. But this is where we are today. But I think that if we follow the plan put in place by the Energy Commission, we should not be been here and we should not be here. We must, from going forward, we must begin to work towards adding onto our generation. And this must be through competitive bidding, not an emergency approach because we won't get value for money through that. We must work on our transmission line, our distribution lines, because technical losses is really, uh, you know, straining the financial, uh, you know, segment of the entire power sector. We must work around the cash waterfall system, adhere to it, and make sure that, uh, you know, it works effectively. We must block the leakages, both in terms of commercial and technical, uh, mm. you know, uh, things. And I'm sure we'll be good going forward. And also work to ensure that additional supply of gas comes on stream. Many a time, we don't seem to maximize the utilization of our own domestic gas resources because we have only one gas processing plant. We need to bring one on board so that it can really process more of our own domestic gas for purposes of industrialization and power generation. Uh, Dr. Semantia, what, what, the Millennium Challenge account, of course, we know how uh, last uh, tranche went subsequently because of... Uh, poor handling of the semi-privatization, uh, the PDS scandal, so to speak. Uh, is the U.S. government still having that challenge with us in terms of situating and enabling us access to the Millennium Challenge Compact? Um, What's think, the latest? I think on? we exited from the compact. compact. Okay. So currently we have nothing to do with the U.S. So it means the last tranche we lost it? We lost it. We lost it completely. But um, I've heard the, um, the presidential candidate for the NDC assure us that if he wins the election, he will go back to the U.S. and try to beg and renegotiate for... Beg return, and renegotiate? Yeah, a, a return to the compact so that at least the money that we lost could be restored to us. I'm not too sure how the Americans would respond to that, but I think... If we can get that money back, it will help a lot. There are a lot of system losses when it comes to the energy sector. It's been our bane. And once we, we lose that, whether it's in the generation, the 
transmission especially and then the distribution and then we don't collect also even the right revenues for the ones that we're able to uh, put uh, around the metering system it means that consumers will suffer why have we got into that stage or how why have we always had that those issues when it comes to the the uh, energy and its distribution we we need to recognize that we have made enormous progress and i just like teachers will say i'll say um, there's more room for improvement but there's been a lot of progress in that regard and we saw that under the former ECG boards, when he set up a special tax force to go and... Oh, Mr. Mahama? No. Uh, yes, Dubik Mahama. Dubik? Yes, that's right. He did a lot in terms of improving... He was your friend? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I worked very closely with them, supporting some of the initiatives that they undertook. And I think the, the, the results were evident. I mean, collections improved. Um, the downside of those activities that sh sought to improve collection was that um, some of the revenues that were generated in that period were not disclosed. Mm. Uh, I think they also um, did some introduction of some digitization using Haptel. I think as a result of the Haptel intervention, um, revenues actually doubled um, from about 700, 600, 700 to about 1.3, 1.4 billion, making ECG the largest revenue generator in, within the economy. Um, um, I, I, what do you call it? With MTN playing a, a second you mean place. A, a, a single vehicle revenue generator. Revenue generator, that's what I mean, the industry. Um, so really, uh, there was a lot of improvement, but we didn't get the kind of transparency that would have ensured that these additional revenues were brought into the cash water for mechanism. So even though close to 1.3 billion was generated, only about six to 700 million was reported by ECG uh, to the cash water for mechanism. Mm. Of course, we are aware, and I'm also uh, sure that the policymakers and regulators are aware of why ECG will keep some money on the side. Uh, first and foremost, ECG has argued that if they were to bring everything they collect into the cash waterfall mechanism, they will not have enough money to finance their operations in order to generate the revenue. Um, another dimension of the whole problem is the fact that we haven't properly segmented the power industry. We and have so, not? No. So we have allowed generators to get into the distribution um, sector of the, uh, of the value chain. So, for instance, between um, VRA and Grico, all manner of arrangements are being made for bulk supply of power to certain entities. I know currently there are some discussions for bulk supply of power to even a hotel. Uh, these things then take away the juiciest part of the, uh, of the business. And, and, and then ECG is left with the high risk bearing that where... Uh, consumers are most likely to default, that is the bit that mm. ECG has to contend with. Mm. And it doesn't allow. So once ECG has brought those issues up, I would have expected that at least we sit around the table and see how we deal with these concerns. Because we haven't confronted these concerns uh, head on, it has, uh, it has provoked ECG to do all manner of things to be able to survive. kind of survive. All right, uh, Dr. Fori, at the end of the day, there have been some policy misfits and poor implementation of some others. ASAP has been very loud on the transmission losses. ASAP has been very loud on the subject of PDS. ASAP has been very loud on having a third party um, manage revenue through uh, whether it's an application, et cetera. And how do we find some finality? Would you say we need an investigation, a forensic audit into how some of these actions were, were undertaken in the future government? Post-2025, um, 20, 20, uh, January? I think it's, it's, it's important for us to highlight some of these um, key um, issues. And as you've, as you've mentioned, you know, there has been a lot of policies that surrounds how we can implement or improve our 
power distribution and you talk about the transmission losses which actually bring finally to the, to the point that we need a lot of investments within our transmission um, sector and um, unfortunately we don't see much on, on, on transmission especially within the um, the manifesto for for MPP, the NDC provides some few um, issues. Um, on, on distribution, there's the need to ensure that we have that kind of you know efficiency because they are key um, people responsible for financial you know generation as far as the power sector value chain is is concerned. We had been very loud on the on the PDS issue because we believed that if the processes for and bringing in their private partner was 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 very transparent and was was done with the level of you know ensuring that those who were more technical and financially viable and capable to handle our assets were were the ones who were really brought to 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 bear we could have improved this this distribution sector and those are the things that we need to really take note of and and and, and bring finality to as far as our distribution sector is concerned now we as we wind up this conversation Let's be um, also very expansive on the subject of making sure that um, perhaps we get into the bottom of many of these related matters. PDS, what do we do with PDS post uh, January 2025? I, I don't expect to bring uh, us to bring PDS back, but then we have to interrogate the processes leading up to uh, you know, the packaging of PDS ECG concessionary agreement, and uh, we have to interrogate uh, to find why the deal uh, was botched. Uh, we all understand some of the shortcomings, but then there could be more. We all understood very well that uh, it was it was shrouded some way or the other. Um, no transparency. Um, you know, condition precedent were made condition subsequent and all that, uh, we realize interference in the whole process. At the end of the day, we lost out on an opportunity that could have fixed uh, parts of our distribution challenges. There's the reason why for which we are seeing as high as, uh, you know, 17% of losses in ECG through technical uh, means. And so we must investigate that PDS ECG arrangement it must not be pushed under the carpet. But who would do this? I don't, I don't expect, uh, you know, should uh, my good friend, Dr. Baumia win the election, I don't expect anything to be done about this. But it's been made clear uh, by our folks on the other side that uh, they will investigate that and we add our voice to that uh, if the opportunity comes, that ECG PDS arrangement is investigated and probably find another way uh, to get uh, donors back to the table to support us. Because if we don't fix, you know, the distribution, the bits of our, uh, you know, um, power subsector, we'll still be making losses. Mm. We'll still be having reliable power supply. And so going forward, I think that beyond the investigation, we must seek to invest more in both the transmission and the distribution sector most importantly, in the ECG and to some extent in NETCO. All right. Um, so I have a couple of comments coming in, and uh, I'll just go through and then try to read many of them before uh, I call it a morning. We have Cash Out Goes with the Short Code, Star 439 hand. Make sure you're part of it. Uh, this one is coming from Two Fit Free Skills. Esla was not used for its intended purpose, and PDS fraudulent way of acquisition made uh, us lose money. Uh, especially coming from the U.S. government through MIDA and, and uh, the compact, so to speak. And then um, we have more. This says uh, there must be forensic auditing, especially PDS and ESLA. And that's from um, Adam Hoga Kojo, who's watching on, on our stream. And a couple of you as well. Yeah, February says DMB is very committed. We have a couple more of those messages as well. Dr. Steve Manteo, um, what do we do with the legacy debt? We securitize ESLA. So at the end of the day, we have to make sure we get to that end of paying back because we have a, a bond on that, uh, an external bond on that. So, so what do we do?
to make sure that we deal with the legacy debt? Well, we have a framework for dealing with the legacy debt, which is the ESLA. Problem has been that we have not actually implemented ESLA and used its resources for some, a lot of the times for the intended purposes. Um, I think my attention was drawn to an instance where ESLA resources were used to pay road contractors and stuff like that. So if we continue like this, then chances are that we will never be able to liquidate the legacy debt. Mm. And this is the same situation in which Tema Oil Refinery finds itself. I think there is also some framework for liquidating legacy debt mm. um, accrued by Tema Oil Refinery, and we've been paying this debt for over two decades, and we don't know when we'll finish paying. I think there's, there's got to be some transparency in the repayment and, and liquidation of the debt over time, mm. so that we know how much we paid so far, how much is left to be paid, and what time frame at the mm. current rate mm. would it take for us to be able to liquidate the debt. There's got, there's got to be um, an end to the ESLA at some point, and citizens need to be made aware, mm -hmm. and that, that can be done only through transparent reporting on how the ESLA is performing. Liquidation. That's, that's a massive effort to undertake. I don't know how within our current uh, restructured uh, debts we have with our external creditors, how we're going to undertake that. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But Dr. Steve Montiel, thank you for coming on the, around the table this morning. It's rare to see you in the studio. And so we're grateful, sir. And then also uh, Dr. Furry as well. Um, lead uh, expert when it comes to climate change, some uh, adaptative policy initiatives at um, the African Center for Energy Policy, known in short as ASAP. And thank you for passing through as well. A regular on the show, he's always contributing, especially virtually. Again, today he appeared virtually. Nana Amwesi, the seventh executive director, Institute for Energy Security. Um, you, you're hopeful for our sector, right? Nana Mwesi. Again, Roland. You're hopeful that the, the sector will be, will be changing, both mainstream energy, uh, climate change ad adaptation, the adoption of renewables, and then the transitions that we need. Now, I, I'm told that you advise Dr. Baumia, for example, that we have EV cars available, so... Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, to a large extent, we are hopeful that uh, the energy sector will change because the two key political parties have chain out uh, very good uh, you know, uh, policies. It means that they appreciate and understand the challenges that we have in the sector and what it takes to uh, you know, uh, move us to a very secured uh, uh, position. However, we are unsure to show Mm. If we will implement all the policies and how they intend to implement it, but if they're able to implement it, um, I'm sure that we have a very sound energy sector and uh, an extractive sector. We are hopeful that uh, it, will be, it will be better if they follow their own policies. Thank you very much, all of you, uh, for joining us and helping us have a comprehensive discussion today, devoid of the politicians. So we're having those who do the advisory, the advocacy when it comes to climate change, the environment, energy, the extractive industry, oil and gas, or however you choose to call it, right here in the studio, as well as uh, also on stream. And uh, we've been very much blessed to have all of you. Thank you very much. Have a blessed day. Uh, Musa Abatwa in Aswansi says, Roland. The fight against Galamse cannot be separated from the role of the government, particularly the current administration. He continues, numerous reports, including investigations by journalist Erasto Asaridonko and revelations by Professor Frimpo Mbwati, have pointed fingers at the Ekufuadu and Baumia-led government as key enablers of these Galamse activities. And uh, he continues. And then also Mike um, Aflu also um, sends us a number of uh, messages as well. I heard that Dr. Baumbi is saying on a political platform that he's introducing solar energy into Ghana. This is diabolical. Solar energy was introduced by John Mahama in the Ghana Solar Support Project for Solar Systems, which, which was to, to have been installed in all regions.
campaigns of the country. This project was placed under the supervision of the PRC. After the 2016 elections, the NPP suspended the work of all contractors to undertake value for money audits. They refused to pay the solar contractors. After a series of protest demonstration by the contractors, PRC gave them a serious Topio Joe haircut <laughs> and reluctantly underpaid some of the contractors who agreed to play ball. Well, at the end of the day, I guess our discussions have said that we've been very wishy-washy with what the streamlined policy should be. There's, there's been a lack of coherence, they say. Well, uh, please, we have cash out. Goes with the short code, star 439 hash. Choose option two, TV three. And then when you get the prompt, you increase the number of tickets you have, also enables you to get money credited into your mobile money account each time we do the draws. So fantastic period for you to make sure, as Nash, of course, said, to save for the 65 days of January. So keep staking as many times as you can. When we do the draws, you'll be blessed. As always, we have 2,000 Ghana cities, uh, uh, 4,000 Ghana cities going. And ultimately, when it comes to the mega jackpot, we have also 10,000 Ghana cities in each draws, 5,000 Ghana cities in all, 50,000 Ghana cities given at each uh, working week on Friday through the mega jackpot, but build up to that and make sure that as Christmas is coming, you're escaping to Malin Resort where love and magic come alive. So you have to choose from their exclusive Christmas packages for couples. The common packages have great features, including what they call the full board meal plan being breakfast, lunch, dinner. Assorted local beverages all available and dispenser water at your beck and call. Breakfast accompanied by soothing morning classical songs. They'll play you Enya, they'll play you Aquabwa, Kujuentri, all the things that you want. There's also the Point and Grill at the Kente Grill restaurant, romantic bonfire dinners at the Gazebo Garden, access to the swimming pool, state of the art gym, and in house games. Remember, all these have 10% off on many services, including the spa, point and kill fish packages, and the options are available. On the first day of the Christmas package, which is going for 3,700 Ghana cities, it is ideal for a short getaway. On the second day of the Christmas package, which is going for 5,700 Ghana cities, you stay for one night, then you get the second night for free. Dinner on arrival, in addition, and breakfast on the final day. On the third day of the Christmas package, if you get that far, which is 6,900 Ghana cities, you have two nights, and then you get a third night for free. This is unparalleled. Luxury and relaxation, all to make sure that you treat yourself and your loved ones to an unforgettable Christmas experience at Marlin Resort. Make sure you book now, Marlin Resort, Today is available. Call the following lines or contact them 059-20-24622 or 059-20-24591. We're taking a break. When we come back, we have cash out the zone with Star 439 Hash. We'll bring you the latest sports headlines. We're taking a break. We'll be right back. <laughs>